so let's, let's get to the answer. What's the current guideline for treatment of MS? Well, we don't really have a current guideline for treatment of MS. We have some very old guidelines from the American Academy of Neurology that basically were a review of the data, the strength of the data on the early disease-modifying therapies, which were mainly the interferon betas and GA and the added natalizumab, et cetera. But that's more a review of how strong is the data, how certain can you make statements about decreasing relapses, et cetera. The National MS Society has endorsed treating active relapsing MS as soon as possible, but not given any other guidelines. So this is a very fluid area, particularly when you have 10 FDA-approved drugs for relapsing forms of MS, and it's not always absolutely clear that one emerges as the optimum choice in the majority of patients. That's, that's, not, uh, that's not the reality right now. So you're using things such as trying to judge drug efficacy, safety, tolerability, the extent of the disease, patient factors such as comorbidity, et cetera. So it becomes a very complex question. We need better biomarkers. We need better biomarkers of the MS disease process. We would like to get biomarkers that say, what's the optimum agent for this particular, page, uh, this particular patient? And how can we tell quickly within a month or two that they're responding absolutely well or they're not? And so we don't waste further time on a drug that they're not responding very well to. All right, so, so you hit two things. One is, that this is a very complex interaction and discussion between the physician and the patient based on what we think of their disease, their comorbidities, what they would take, because that's kind of critical, and what we hope will work best for them. But the more important guideline, and this comes from the National MS Society, is that patients should be treated with active MS should be treated as early as possible. That's the guideline, they should be treated. And that they should have access to every agent because this is a complicated procedure. And I don't see a big problem with that. So tell me where there's a problem. You know, I think I can start there. I, I totally agree with you because physicians are treating individuals. And there is a need to individualize therapy to, to a point, uh, especially in the absence of things like biomarkers or anything else that we can use to more properly tailor therapy. On the other hand, payers have to deal with populations. We really can't look at individuals. Leslie and I uh, work on a population basis. So when we create our formularies, when we create our clinical management programs, we need to have those programs that, that will be what we judge based on the evidence to be the best for most of the population. Uh, and with that, uh, you know, even in MS, uh, we will look, for instance, at the, uh, at the interferons and, and say, therapeutically, they're roughly equivalent. Yes, you can tease out differences of high dose versus low dose and intramuscular versus sub-Q and once a week versus multiple times a week. But in the end, they all do the same thing. And so in the absence of really anyone emerging as a leader, you know, we're forced to look back, okay, what's the cost of these different agents? Uh, what's the market share of these different agents? Uh, you know, and put that together to try to make uh, formulary decisions. So one of the key differences between practicing medicine, which I did for a lot of years, and practicing uh, population medicine, which I did for even more years, is you have to do a lot more generalizing in your strategies. Uh, you know, the cost of these therapies just make it impossible to just have open access to everything at any time. Uh, there's, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're rapidly approaching uh, uh, an era of, of unaffordable health benefits uh, if we haven't already crossed that. So, um, you know, I agree with you in a world of unlimited resources, it would be nothing wrong with anything for anyone at any time. But we've actually crossed that bridge a long time ago. Um, and just adding on, we absolutely agree with you that um, the patients should start as early as possible because yeah. I think everybody, I, I think, again, the data there is for the decrease in the acute attacks mm -hmm. and the remit and relapsing phase. I don't think that there's not. And like you, as I said at the very beginning, that we definitely, you know, that inflammation, is it just as you said in one of the studies we've all read, you know, is there a residual problems, disease that occur from that, and yes, we all um, like it. The interesting thing, though, that um, we, we, and you began to talk about it, Dr. Coyle, is that what do you call a failure on the therapy? So we have had, um, and when you talk about open 
access, et cetera. We have had people wanting to switch therapies after eight weeks, um, 12 weeks, but what is a failure? We, we have not defined it. I'm not sure anybody has actually been able to define what a, fa what a failure is. Um, by the way, we also have some, had some people that have wanted to um, prescribe double therapy, polypharmacy, at the same time. And I don't think we have any data on that. Um, so there are certain things that we would like to see or that we feel that the management um, is good for in order to see really what's going on. Failure? Well, so a treatment failure or a suboptimal responder, this is a very thorny issue. Uh, there have been articles written about it. There have been small consensus groups. Right now, there are no absolute guidelines. But there are some basic principles. So for example, somebody that's on a treatment eight weeks, you are just getting the effect of the drug at eight weeks, okay? <laughs> know that. Okay, yeah. so they have to be on it a period of time. Most, most people would say, you begin to, you, you give perhaps the first six months and then you judge. It doesn't mean that you might not intervene if they were having disease activity before that, but you would use a finite period of time. Then what do you, what do you judge? Well, number one, you have clinical parameters, relapses. So you're gonna look at relapses. The most recent trials, the average relapse rate is one attack every three to seven or eight years. Yeah. So if somebody's having one attack a year, that's unacceptable. That's probably a uh, failure or a suboptimal responder. Is the neurological exam worsening? Could it reflect subclinical disease activity in the neurological exam? And this requires examining the patient, doing some form of quantitative exam. Is there steady deterioration in cognitive function that you can only attribute to MS? So certainly these would be clinical parameters that you, that you follow. Many neurologists do surveillance or monitoring MRI scans of the brain, at least in the initial few years of relapsing MS, to look at all the disease-modifying therapies should control new lesion development, should minimize new lesion development. It gives you a dimension beyond the clinical, more sensitive in the early phases of, of relapsing. Or are you basically shutting down lesion activity? There's now accumulating data it's mainly with the interferon betas, that if you're on an interferon beta and you have spontaneous enhancing lesions and new T2 lesions occurring, you're failing therapy. You should be switched on that, even if you haven't had a clinical attack. And I think we're gonna be working out parameters such as that, but it dictates you don't just start a drug and then do nothing. You need to clinically follow the patient, and I think there's a reasonable way to do rational surveillance MRI scans, which have to be comparable. You really need to make sure that you're following those sorts of criteria to give you guidance. And you don't want to continue a treatment that's not working. That's you really don't. And again, as I said, we grapple with that quite a bit.